Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media. Today on Spotlight, how the Eurasian tree sparrow made its way to St. Louis over 150 years ago. Plus, meet the new ape at the St. Louis Zoo, why this birth was a really big deal. And then, why Ameren is creating pollinator-friendly fields near some of its substations. But first, WashU researchers develop a cyborg locust that can detect threats. It's Sunday, and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award-winning Spotlight. It keep downsizing this to make sure it can fly. Not long ago, Waylon Lee never imagined what he'd be doing as a third-year PhD student in electrical engineering at Washington University in St. Louis. It looks like a Marvel movie, like it to be a superhero or something. It's not Spider-Man, Ant-Man, or the Wasp, because those are for the comics. However, Lee is on to something. He's working on very real cyborg locusts. And yes, they do seem to have superpowers with their remarkable sensing capabilities. With its ultra super power of smell, could help save lives and the day. Superhero films do have a way of telling these stories. And this one is a Wash U creation in every way. From the comic book look, the bomb sniffing locusts to the real life work in the lab. Once you're digging to the project, it's actually more simple and more realistic than I thought. Locusts are an engineering marvel. They possess superior neural responses. The bomb sniffing locusts can even discriminate between the odors of different explosives. It can fly into some really harsh environments and sense the unknown odor for us. Before going into battle, every superhero has a suit, right? backpack, we can wirelessly receive all those signals sent by our friend. The backpacks record the locust's brain activity when exposed to odors. Lee is working on miniaturizing the backpacks created a few years ago. They're too heavy to wear while flying. This is the prototype. We are trying to further decrease the size and weight of our current backpack to ensure the locusts can fly for longevity for a long distance. And then the plan is to guide the locusts like a remote control. And electronically stimulate, try to kind of like guide them to go which direction. You can control the biological organism and steer it towards the region of interest. Barani Rahman, professor of biomedical engineering at Washington University, is leading this collaborative team of researchers. The main goal of the lab is to understand the design and computing principles of the sense of smell. The National Science Foundation awarded the research group $4.3 million to help develop the cyborg locus and study odor-guided navigation. The goal of this particular funding is to create brain-machine interfaces to study how the insect brain works while it is sensing and converting it into a behavior. In Raman's lab, the locusts follow a specific odor on a specially built treadmill while walking on a foam ball. The locust is going in the direction of that odor. To control what chemical cues we are presenting, we need to be able to record neural activity from the insect brain while it is actually smelling and behaving. In this room, there's a surgical procedure to attach electrodes where sensing capabilities are measured. To pick out a specific chemical needle from a chemical haystack, for example. Electrodes into the, into the brain of these insects, put them on a drone or a robot, and use a robot or a drone to carry it to, this, to the region that you want to sample. The pattern of sound will be different for different odors, which basically tells you that the neuron is responding differently to different chemicals. The scientists can one day implant electrodes, seal the locusts, and transport them to mobile environments. Then the biorobotic sensing machines can do what man can't do just yet. Biology actually beats engineering hands down in terms of its complexity. And right now, since we cannot do better than biology, can we tap into the capabilities of the biological organism? Eventually, Raman wants to replicate the locust sensing capabilities to create robotic systems and various sensors. The goal for the applications for electronic nose is to non-invasively sense chemicals 
of different for different applications biomedicine homeland security environmental monitoring and so on for example breathalyzer for for uh, sensing um, for early diagnosis of diabetes or uh, kidney kidney cancer or lung cancer and that's what superheroes are made of and now we're using these wires to inject into his brain saving the world one wire and one signal at a time HEC Media, recognized, celebrated, honored time and again for excellence in the industry. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. History Spotlight, brought to you by HEC Media and the Missouri Historical Society. Hello, I'm Dr. Jody Sowell, president of the Missouri Historical Society in St. Louis, and this is History Spotlight. Over 150 years ago, one man's homesickness led to a colony of two dozen Eurasian tree sparrows being transplanted to St. Louis. Public historian Andrew Wonka tells us how this has influenced the St. Louis bird population today. It's a timeless truth across generations and places that anytime someone has to leave home, heartbreak is sure to follow. One of the ways 19th century wealthy European immigrants were chasing away some of that homesickness when they came to North America was by importing starlings and finches and some of the old world European songbirds that they had known into the new world of North America. Well, one person in 1870s St. Louis that was feeling particularly homesick was German newspaper editor Carl Denzer. If you've got a keen eye, Carl Denzer's name is one you might have noticed on a piece of public artwork around town. He's one of three German journalists honored on the Naked Truth statue in Compton Hills, a small park by the water reservoir. Well, in 1870, Carl Denzer was living in a massive mansion at 1812 Missouri Avenue, just a block away from Lafayette Park shady groves of trees. The park's birds were just fine, but Denzer was longing to see the European songbirds of his childhood darting around amongst the park's trees. He worked with a local importer to import 24 Eurasian tree sparrows. This is a bird that is beyond unassumingly common in Europe and Asia, but entirely unknown in North America. He happened to get these 24 birds, and in April of 1870, he let them go in Lafayette Park. The birds must have loved their new home just fine because now, 150 years later, St. Louis has a permanent population of Eurasian tree sparrows numbering 15,000, every single one of them a descendant of Carl Denzer's colony of 24 transplants. The Eurasian tree sparrow today is a completely unique local aspect of St. Louis wildlife. Because this bird is a non-migratory species, they cannot be found anywhere else except for about 100 miles north up the Mississippi River Valley to about Hannibal. Because of this, birders from all across the United States have this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that otherwise would require them to get on a transoceanic flight to see this small bird, but instead they can come right here to St. Louis and see it in their own backyards. Birders have been known to schedule intentional layovers at Lambert Airport just to get the chance to see one. Included among them was James Schlesinger, President Richard Nixon's Secretary of Defense, who in 1972 chartered a private helicopter from Lambert to a local high school football field just so he could jump out and get a sight of one of these Eurasian tree sparrows. Today, we would completely frown on something like Carl Denzer releasing 24 foreign birds into our local ecosystem. We fight very aggressively and expensively to control the introduction of new populations into long established environments. All you have to do is look at creatures like the emerald ash borer or the Asian carp or kudzu vines and see their presence in North America to realize the sort of cascades of environmental damage that can be caused by something even as small as a songbird. While environmentalists and scientists are always keeping a watchful eye, thankfully it appears that the Eurasian tree sparrow's presence is essentially benign, leaving us free to enjoy them. If you want to go out and look for one yourself, you're gonna be looking for a small bird, about five and a half inches tall. It has brown wings with a chestnut colored crown on top of its head. It has pure white cheeks with a small black dot in the center of each. And unlike St. Louis's iconic cardinals, the plumage on both the males and females is identical. It has a shrill metallic chirp, so just listen for that and follow your eyes uh, and hopefully you'll find one. Next week on History Spotlight, discover remnants of the World's Fair in St. Louis, still visible 120 years after its grand opening. To learn more about the Missouri Historical Society, visit mohistory.org.
HEC Media, bringing you culture and community. Find all of HEC's positive programming and award-winning content at hecmedia.org. Our newest addition to Jungle of the Apes and the Primate Care team is uh, Forrest. He is a Sumatran orangutan, and he was born on December 22nd of 2023. They only about, have about three to four infants throughout their lifetime, so a birth is extremely important and critical to the population. Ruby is a first-time mom, so with that comes some questionable things. You know, there is risk involved just because she hasn't had a baby before. Uh, she did have the, a great teacher and her mom, so she was able to watch Ginger be raised by Mira, their, their mother, uh, but you, we still just didn't know how she was going to react to having that baby, so just uh, we wanted to do all we could to provide her with all the skills that she might need. We use a lot of positive reinforcement training here at the zoo and incorporate that into the everyday training and management practices with uh, a lot of the animals, and especially our great apes. This is a fetal Doppler, so same as people use. And basically we use this to train Ruby to allow us to take um, voluntary ultrasounds throughout the pregnancy so we can help the vet staff and ourselves monitor the growth of Forrest uh, during gestation and during her pregnancy and make sure he has a healthy heartbeat as well. Trained to present her, her belly and then this just kind of touches her belly. So we actually um, would use the ultrasound gel and then put a glove over it since she didn't like the feeling of the gel. So it still works that way. Yeah. So that was just trained to yeah touch your belly and get that ultrasound. This is the plush toy we use to mimic uh, Ruby's baby during her pregnancy. And basically we trained her to pick this plush up and then also showed her where to having the head up where uh, the baby would go on her chest for nursing, but then also or give, handing this baby through a baby transfer carrier that was specially designed in case we needed to assist in any way. Sumatran orangutans are critically endangered. The threats that face them are the biggest one is habitat loss. So orangutans are arboreal. They spend all their times up in the trees. Those trees are really important for so many reasons. So it's how they keep from getting diseases, how they stay safe from predators, where they get their food from. So they would really never come down to the ground. So when the forest gets chopped down um, for a lot of the reasons have to do with plantations, um, palm oil plantations, then they do don't have access to those resources. Palm oil is found in so many products that we use. It's found in food, it's found in household supplies like shampoo. Um, but what people can do is either, um, there's an app that you can use to find out what is sustainable palm oil. Sometimes there's a little symbol on packages. Um, so really being conscientious of when you're shopping to that you're looking for those sustainable palm oil products. We actually partner with Hutan, which is a grassroots conservation organization in uh, Malaysia that actually is replanting those forests. It's doing a lot of research and working with the local communities um, to promote orangutan conservation as well as other species. Um, and that's actually where forest's name comes from. So Hutan um, actually means forest in the Malay language. And it's really important to have a new baby. It gives people the chance to learn about orangutans when they come see him at the zoo, to start caring about orangutans and really do their part to help orangutans in Indonesia and Malaysia um, who are critically endangered and facing so many threats. For more St. Louis stories, subscribe to the HEC YouTube channel. Connect STL from HEC Media. My name is Katherine Alexander. I'm a Pisanki artist, which means I work on eggshells. This is an ancient folk art that originates in Ukraine. It celebrates the end of winter and the arrival of spring. It's a celebration of that new growth, that new life, and the abundance that nature gives us when the hens start laying eggs again. All of my work is created on real eggshells. They are hollow and drained and varnished so they can last a lifetime, but they are truly representative of what Mother Nature gives us to work with. And they represent that duality in life that something can be fragile enough to shatter and yet strong enough to sustain life. For me, this art starts by picking out the right eggshell for a project. I will write on the eggshell with wax, and I use a tool called a kiska. From there, it goes into a series of dye baths. 
followed by more wax writing. And each session preserves that color on the shell until I reveal the final piece by melting off all of the wax. You don't see pisanki every day at every art fair. I learned this tradition from my Polish mother, and I'm proud to hand it down to future generations. I'm also very excited to take something that is traditional and meaningful to a lot of people and be one of the artists who are elevating it to fine art status. It brings me a lot of joy to enter this into categories in juried art fairs and see the art thrive. I really love presenting at open air art fairs because it gives the public a chance to see this old folk art in a new modern way. So often people walk in and are drawn into leaning closer and noticing the fine details and what is achievable on an eggshell. And what keeps people staying in is learning about the symbolism of all of the colors and the motifs and how everything has a bigger meaning in this ancient, ancient art. All of the colors have meaning as well as the motifs. Yellow is the color of wisdom, it comes from the sun. Red is the color of passion, not falling in love passion, but more what are you excited about in your life passion. And if you put those two together, you get my favorite, orange, the color of endurance. It would be great to meet you in person and have you experience this art outside in nature and really be able to see those three-dimensional details up close. Meet Katherine Alexander and see her work in person at the Laumeyer Sculpture Park Annual Art Fair, May 10th through the 12th. Visit LaumeyerSculpturePark.org for more info. Later on Spotlight, how the St. Louis Literary Awards began and why they're more important now than ever. This open field in the middle of Illinois is filled with native wildflowers and other plants that attract pollinators. And butting up against it is this power substation. Surprisingly, that was part of the plan. Amarin has been planting pollinator-friendly uh, native vegetation projects for over 10 years now. And prior to that, wherever there's an opportunity to put in a soft herbaceous plant community, so native wildflowers and shorter growing grasses, we do that. One of the focuses is pollinators. The monarch butterfly is supposed to be listed as threatened or endangered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the near future. And we know that our work could have an impact on those habitats. And when you are also managing for monarchs, you help other pollinators like native bees, the honeybees that are around pollinating flies, wasps, beetles. Um, there are a lot of pollinators out there. All that insect biodiversity, you're supporting birds, small animals, all the other animals that eat those things. So we're having a great effect throughout food chain, food web, the local ecosystem. In addition to providing a safe haven for pollinators, this type of project has another benefit. Projects like this are great for managing stormwater. The roots of the native plants around me have root systems that are much longer than the plant is tall. So they cut down into the clay uh, and all of the soil around and they're able to create a more absorptive surface for rainwater to actually fall and become absorbed rather than hit a hard surface or like, you know, uh, soil that's like hard packed and, you know, hasn't been worked in a while, especially around our developed areas. We have, you know, soil that is definitely packed down. Water won't be hitting that and rolling off into a storm sewer, down a drainage ditch, and contributing to localized flash flooding. And she says individuals don't have to have hundreds of acres to make a difference. They can do it in their own backyards. You don't need a whole lot of species to get going in your garden to be able to provide a positive benefit to monarch butterflies and other pollinators. If you want to manage for monarchs, add a milkweed component in there. If you have just a little triangle in the back of your yard, you're not sure what to plant, or maybe you're looking for a different garden idea, or you wanna plant even a mailbox garden just in the front of your property, you can put it anywhere where you have enough sun, you can get water to it and start your native plants. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight.
think writers are the Sherpas of the emotional truth. They are our historians. They are our storytellers. Literature is one of those things that brings people together. Every community in the history of the world has its own story. Books create a conversation, and the conversation has through lines that stay the same, but it also changes in response to the moment in time. For more than 50 years, some of the most important writers of their moment in time have been coming to the campus of St. Louis University to receive the St. Louis Literary Award, an honor which grows in prestige every year with the addition of every name. It's lovely for the writers. I also think it's a way for us as a community to sort of stand up for what we treasure. We don't always like the things we read. We don't always like things people are saying. But universities are about being challenged. Chinu Achebe once said, the job of a writer is not to provide solutions, but to provide headaches. And I think all of us need that kind of headache every now and then. The St. Louis Literary Award is a very valuable and important way to ask these bigger questions about why are we here? What is our purpose? What is our vocation? I think that's an enduring contribution of the award itself. One of the things that I love about the original idea of this program was to build a bridge between the university and the St. Louis community, and that's never faded. If anything, we've tried to really double down, triple down, quadruple down on that idea. We are trying to do our part to make sure that literature is honored and revered. Please join me in welcoming Margaret Atwood. It's an honor to have been invited to receive the St. Louis Literary Award for 2017. By now, the list of St. Louis awardees includes, in its more recent years, some of my old friends, both living and dead, and I am happy and grateful to be joining them. To be clear, the award part, not the deadness part. The seeds of the award program were planted in 1966, when a fundraiser was held to benefit the campus libraries. The poet Mark Van Doren was brought in to give a speech. The huge turnout left the sponsors speechless. It was a complete shock, but knowing a good thing when they see one, the board said, let's make this an annual event. The following year, they turned it into an award ceremony with a single writer chosen once a year to receive the prize in person. Nominations for the St. Louis Literary Award can be submitted by anyone, but most suggestions come from a select and diverse committee of devoted readers who spend almost an entire year picking the next year's winner. It's a very wide scan of the literary world in the broadest sense, and the sort of messy, exciting process takes place. We may be looking at a poet, but we might sometimes include prose. We may be looking at a novelist, but we might sometimes include nonfiction as well. I think we want to have a writer who will be read in the contemporary environment, but whose work will stand the test of time. Please put your hands together and welcome Neil Gaiman. The award ceremony is open to the public and includes a live onstage interview with the winning writer. Before the winner is introduced, the audience gets a show with performers offering entertainment informed by the work of the winner. What we always hear is they are amazed at the experience and the receptiveness of audiences in St. Louis. How does research fit into your writing process? The St. Louis Literary Award is really a series of events. I find that the research opens up these worlds for me. The day after the ceremony, the award winner gives a craft talk. Writing about this period, Kincaid states simply, you came. There are also guest lectures related to the works of the chosen author. There are writing contests and a campus read where students faculty, and the community at large are invited to read and discuss 
one or sometimes two books, written by the upcoming year's award winner. I think it's amazing. I think it just creates this inclusivity and also just a sense of community where they're, everyone's reading about kind of the same topic. You never know what book is going to change your mind or make you feel differently or reveal something. And it all begins with the writer. That's why the award is designed to look like the nib of a fountain pen. But perhaps its symbolic shape is also a reminder that the story of the St. Louis Literary Award is still being written. The last few years has definitely been more diverse in terms of really looking at non-American specific writers, you know, either people who are from other places or write about other places. I think it's really important. That's what it means to be a citizen of the world. I'm hoping that we can get more donors to support this because of how distinctive it is. Our region needs more things like this. We need books to deepen our humanity and stay alive and smart and thoughtful as a culture. There's actually a bumper sticker on my car and it's a Ray Bradbury quote and it says, you don't need to burn books to destroy a culture, just get people to stop reading them. What are the scribes to do in these difficult times of ours? The scribes will write according to their calling. Some will exhort, some will record, some will reflect, some will dramatize. They will try to tell the truth as best they can. They will try to tell inventive and instructive and convincing and sometimes beautifully made lies because that's what the scribes do. If all goes well a hundred years from now, the readers of the future will look back at the work of the scribes of today and they will say, that's how it was among the all two human beings there and then. Which is all a scribe can ask for, wouldn't you say? The winner of the St. Louis Literary Award for 2024 is Jamaica Kincaid. The award ceremony will be held April 25th at the Sheldon Concert Hall. For tickets, go to MetroTix.com. Next week, details and stories rarely heard from the 1904 World's Fair. Plus, a former rock and roll roadie builds a 340,000 square foot structure in Chesterfield. Find out what's inside. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.